As I was sat thinking about the topic of my next video, I pondered about how we go about piecing together the human story. On this channel, we have covered many topics within anthropology, from the first significant human tools to the development of language. But I've never explained in great detail how anthropologists reach these conclusions. What is the criteria for the Homo genus? How do anthropologists analyze evidence? How do we know how extinct humans behaved? These are all questions that are imperative to understanding how we undertake the daunting task of piecing together the past. Hopefully, after this video, those of you who don't already understand will have a stronger grasp on how we can piece together the beautiful story that is our evolution. Please enjoy. Human is a word that comes from the Latin word humanus. The word man, translated to Latin, is homo, and it is believed that humanus is a hybrid combination of both homo and humus, meaning earth. A human is any species that is classified under the homo genus, with only one known surviving species, us, homo sapiens. There are possibly 18 species under homo, this number is subject to change, however, as some of these species are not attributed to Homo with total certainty. For example, one of these 18 species is Homo ergaster, which is the subject of much debate in paleoanthropology, as it could be the African version of Homo erectus as an opposed to its own species. Without DNA evidence from specimens of both supposed species, we can't know for certain as genetic difference is what separates a species from one another. That's why, around the world today, all different races of Homo sapiens are considered the same species because there is very, very little difference in our DNA. Other species, like Homo capronensis, are only known from one fossil specimen, which means it's very difficult to piece together the skeleton making it hard to know for certain whether the specimen might just be an abnormal member of an existing species or whether it's a human at all. There are six species that are certainly Homo, and these are Homo sapien, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo naledi, and Homo floriensis. There may even be more species of human, it just depends on who you ask. Some paleoanthropologists consider every species under the Australopithecus, Ardipithecus, and Paranthropus genus as human. For the sake of clarity, in this video, when I refer to human, I will be talking about all species that are categorized under the genus Homo. A question I'm sure lots of people are asking is how do we determine if a species is human or not? Paleoanthropologists will look at the fossils that have been unearthed and organize them. Using help from other fields like geology and paleontology, they will then begin to piece together parts of the specimen's past, starting by dating the fossil. One way they do this is by bringing in geologists that will study the sediment where the hominin fossil was found. While studying the sediment, geologists will take into consideration the laws of superposition which persists that as you go deeper into the earth, layers get older. As long as rock layers have not been disturbed due to human, animal or geological activity. Thus, artifacts or fossils found in one layer are either older or younger than those found in deeper or shallower layers. Absolute dating techniques are also used, which involve both the assemblage of flora and fauna and the chemical composition of deposits in order to match those of unknown age with those of known age and order the progression of environments, organisms and climatic activity within regions. The best known absolute dating techniques are radiometric dating methods which use carbon-14 to date organic material. Carbon-14 dating dates fossils under 60,000 years old, measuring the remaining carbon-14 in organic materials. Since plants use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, they contain all three isotopes of carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, in the approximate ratios present in the atmosphere. 
Animals eat plants, and thus at any particular time, they will approximately have all the same amount of carbon-14. Once they die, they no longer accumulate carbon. The level of the more stable carbon-12 can then be compared to the remaining carbon-14 to determine when they died. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years old. That is when half of the carbon-14 will have been lost in a specimen in that amount of time. Other dating methods could be used, depending on the rough estimated date based on the rock layer. Some of these other methods are uranium-thorium dating, ESR dating, and AAR dating. Once a date is confirmed, the team will abbreviate it to KYA or MYA, KYA being thousands of years ago, and MYA being millions of years ago. Now, anthropologists have an idea of a date. They can begin to piece together the fragments of the specimen. Here it can be discovered if all the findings belong to either one or multiple specimens. We can attribute fragments to specific individuals by considering that if the fossil fragments belong to more than one individual, we'd expect to find more fossilized bones than could possibly belong to a single skeleton. If, for example, archaeologists found three or more femurs, or had discovered two mandibles, they would have known immediately that the remains of multiple individuals were eroding out of the sediments. Because all life on Earth is related, we can find bones that are similar to what we are familiar with. For example, all vertebrates have a skull, which means they also have the calvaria, which is the top part of the skull. So when we find a fossilized calvaria, it will possess characteristics of vertebrates alive today. For example, if we dug up a calvaria that had a ridge running down it, then it's most likely not a human skull and would be more characteristic of a gorilla, chimpanzee or orangutan skull, as it's to facilitate a larger jaw muscle, which, although humans do have a small ridge, it is nowhere near as prominent as other great apes. Once the fragments are pieced together, we have an outline of what the whole or part skeleton would look like, meaning that we can now start to fill in the gaps of the skeleton using other specimens from the same or similar species that may possess bones that are missing from the specimen in question. Once we understand what the skeleton would have looked like, anthropologists will study key characteristics of this potential human. The hips, skull, teeth, feet and hands are all vital to understanding if the specimen is human. For example, with the skull, we can determine the species' brain size, as well as gain an understanding of how it walked. The forum magnum, which is a little hole that sits towards the middle to back of the skull, is vital to understanding this. In other great apes that aren't bipedal, the forum magnum sits towards the back of the skull, allowing the animal to walk on all four limbs and keep its head looking forwards. Whereas in humans, the forum magnum sits further towards the middle, on the bottom of the skull allowing the spine to point down, leaving our heads resting on top. Bipedalism is also indicated with foot and hip structure. When all these features are taken into consideration, we are able to conclude how the animal walked. We can tell if the animal always walked on two legs, walked on its knuckles, or lived up in the trees and walked upright when it briefly came down to the land, just like the famous Lucy. In total, the characteristics that define a human are a relatively large cranial capacity, limb structure adapted to an erect posture and a bipedal gait, smaller jaw and tooth size, well-developed and fully opposable thumbs, hands capable of power and precision grip, and the ability to make standardized tools. It is from some of these features, like hips, teeth, joints and height that can also tell us what gender the specimen is. Also, teeth can help rule out the specimen being young when identifying a female based off size. We can do this because most mammals are born with baby teeth, so a development of crown formation coupled with other factors can go a long way when determining age. When all characteristics align, we can confirm that the specimen, if not already attributed to an existing species, is a new species of homo. Remember, this is only when everything goes right. 
There are so many disagreements and disputes about classification of species because fossil evidence is sometimes misinterpreted or there just isn't enough specimens to recreate the skeleton. Specimens can also be destroyed or damaged when being excavated. It might seem like to some that the assumptions of how extinct humans behaved is mere guesswork, but that isn't necessarily the case. The first human-made artefacts to appear were stone tools about 2.6 million years ago. These remained the best source of evidence about behaviour until relatively recently. A greater variety of archaeological evidence appears in the last 400,000 years, which shows that by this time, people were hunting, using fire in a controlled way, and building shelters. The next phase of great change occurred only within the last 100,000 years, a period that saw the development of human culture into recognisably modern and complex behavioural systems. 1.5 million years ago, in sub-Saharan Africa, lived Homo ergaster, also known as the African Homo erectus. Reconstructions of Homo ergaster's life are based on evidence from many sites in southern and eastern Africa. Archaeological evidence from these sites is limited and shows little variation between sites. This suggests that Homo ergaster had a relatively simple culture and the different populations of these people behaved in very much the same way. Homo ergaster made standardised stone tools using raw materials collected nearby. This was a relatively simple technology requiring little forward planning. The people making this technology had improved mental capacities and skills compared with their earlier ancestors, but the techniques required to make these tools could simply be learned through imitating the actions of others rather than through transmission by language. The earliest tools from 2.6 million years ago are very simple, and at first glance could be mistaken for naturally chipped rocks. Early discoveries of stone tools were actually made after tool markings were noticed on fossilised animal bones and nearby chipped rocks were more closely examined. Investigations have since shown that the breakage patterns on naturally chipped stones are different to those that result when a stone is deliberately chipped and shaped by human actions. Deliberately made tools have breakage patterns including a bulb of precision and ripples produced by shock waves from the blow that chips the stone. The tools used by Homo ergaster indicate a range of activities, including chopping, cutting, and scraping. Looking at stone tools under a microscope provides information about how it was used and what it was used for. Characteristic patterns of wear result when tools are used in different ways. For example, chopping, scraping, and cutting actions each produce a different pattern of scratch marks, cracks, and indentations on the edge of the stone tool. Tools can also be analysed for traces of the material to investigate the use of the tool. This may reveal particular plant fibres, wood, or meat embedded in the edge of the tool. None of the Homo ergaster skeletons that have been found so far were deliberately buried. There is evidence, however, that they did care for living members of their group who were sick or injured, but they did not seem to be concerned with their welfare after death. For instance, a 1.7 million year old female Homo ergaster skeleton, known as KNM ER 1808, found in 1973, was found to have had a debilitating disease, probably hypervitaminosis. She had lived for some time with this disease, indicating that she was looked after by members of her clan. It is probable that these people lived in social groups based on family bonds. A comparison with groups of primates living today suggests that these humans were moving away from a male-dominated social structure. Their developmental rates show that they took longer to mature to adulthood than modern apes. This feature suggests that Homo ergaster had an extended childhood period in which to complete development to maturity. Evidence like the examples I just listed are unexpectedly used when investigating how these humans behaved. Examples of more conspicuous evidence are the art doodles witnessed on the shell by Homo erectus, the Neanderthal cave art in France, 
the Neanderthal Davij Babe flute, and the stone tools found at Grandolina in the Spanish Atapurca Mountains, which could have been used to make clothes. When it comes to our own species, behaviour is much easier to understand, partly because we are the same as the first Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. When thinking about how we behaved in the wild, before cities, cars and supermarkets, we can look at the primitive hunter-gatherer tribes that still live on the earth today. Through this, we can see that we Homo sapiens have had our weird and wacky rituals since the start. And maybe, just maybe, based off the tribes we see today, Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago looked at the stars and made their own conclusions about how they came to be, just like we do today. Thanks for watching today's video. The aim of today's upload was to try and help those that don't have time to understand how scientists come to conclusions about our past. If you enjoyed and wish to see more, then please like, comment and subscribe. See you in the next one.